Welcome to the April update on the Covidence UK study. My name is Adrian Martineau. I'm the chief investigator based at Queen Mary University of London. So in previous webinars, I've presented information relating to risk factors for symptom defined COVID-19 based on classic symptoms such as uh, fever, a new cough and loss of taste or smell. However, there are some strengths, but also some limitations to this approach to defining who has had COVID-19 and who hasn't. In terms of the advantages, the major advantage was that this symptom based approach could capture episodes of COVID-19 that arose before testing was widely available early in the pandemic. However, there are some disadvantages to the approach. Specifically, one can get a significant rate of false positives in people who have symptoms which are attributed to COVID-19, but are actually due to another respiratory infection, and also false negatives, people who have COVID-19, but who don't get classic symptoms. The alternative approach, of course, to capturing an episode of COVID-19 is to use results from uh, nose and throat swab testing. And the big advantage of this is that you get a very low false positive rate. In other words, if the test is positive, it's very likely to reflect true COVID-19 disease. However, the major disadvantage of this uh, up to now was that there were relatively few test positive events due to the lack of testing early in the pandemic. However, the COVID study is now coming up to its first birthday, and this problem has now uh, been uh, overcome in that we now have a total of 424 cases in the cohort that have accumulated since people signed up to the study, uh, of which 32 uh, resulted in hospitalisation. And so this large number of cases that have primarily arose now during the recent second wave of COVID-19 gives us the statistical power to look at risk factors for test defined COVID-19 as opposed to symptom defined disease. And today I just want to ask two questions and show you the data that we've got to answer them. The first question is what are the risk factors for predominantly mild or moderate test confirmed COVID-19 in covid UK participants? And you may be asking, well, why is mild or moderate disease important? Well, the first thing to say is that so-called mild or moderate disease, that is disease which primarily doesn't result in hospitalisation, isn't necessarily mild in, long, in the long term in that it can readily be associated with long COVID, which can be very debilitating for a large number of people. So so-called milder disease is really important from this angle. It's also really important because uh, mild disease essentially arising in younger people is what gives rise to disease in older people or other vulnerable groups. And so we need to understand and control mild disease in order to control the pandemic as a whole. Finally, it's important to understand the risk factors for mild disease, things that's much commoner than severe disease, for uh, to enhance our scientific understanding, which can then lead to development of new strategies uh, to prevent and treat COVID-19. The second question I want to address is, to ask how risk for mild or moderate disease compare with those well-recognized risks for severe disease. So let's take a look at uh, some specific risk factors. Age, of course, is well recognized to be a risk factor for severe disease. The older you are, the more likely you are to require hospitalization, uh, to uh, need intensive care and ventilation and even to die. So what's the relationship between age and risk of getting COVID-19 in the first place? Well, if we look here in this table at date of data from the covid UK study, we can see that with increasing age, the actual risk of having had COVID-19 goes down. So you can see here among people aged 16 to 29 years, about 4.5 percent of them have had COVID-19 compared with just 1.4 percent of people aged 70 or more. This is reflected in this odds ratio here, the number being less than one and colored green represents a decreased risk of COVID-19. So here we have an apparent paradox in that on the one hand, older age is a risk factor for severe disease, but on the other hand, it seems to be protective against getting disease in the first place. Well, why might this be? One of the reasons of course, is that older people may alter their behavior in order to reduce their risk of COVID-19, for example, using public transport less, uh, going out to the shops less than younger people who have uh, who are less worried about the disease because they're less likely to get severe manifestations. So what happens when we adjust for uh, behaviours which affect people's risk of infection? So 
here's uh, what happens and it's a slightly busy slide, but I'll take you through it. This is the adjusted odds ratio. And in this analysis, what we've done is we've adjusted for over 20 different factors can affect people's risk of exposure to SARS-CoV-2, the virus which causes COVID-19, including the number of visits from and to other households, the number of times people go to the shops and their occupation, whether or not they're in frontline healthcare work or social care work. And what we can see here is that once you've adjusted for risks of exposure, age does not relate to one's risk of contracting COVID-19. So putting the whole data together then, we know that older age relates to increased severity, but it doesn't appear to relate to increased susceptibility to disease. What about ethnicity? Well, we know that ethnicity is a risk factor for uh, uh, severe disease with people of South Asian or black ethnic origin having higher rates of hospitalisation and requirement for ICU. When we look at mild or moderate disease in the COVID in UK study, we see that this association holds. In other words, people of Asian or Asian British ethnic origin have around a 2.3 fold increased chance of contracting COVID-19 compared to people of white ethnic origin and with increased risk among uh, mixed and other ethnic groups and also people of black African Caribbean or black British ethnic origin. Although the smaller numbers in these groups mean that this distance, this difference didn't attain statistical significance. And this asterisk here again just reminds us that these analyses have been adjusted for a whole range of factors affecting risk of exposure to SARS-CoV-2. So this difference, in other words, cannot be explained by a whole range of social factors, including uh, type of occupation, um, um, type of housing, and other factors that have been thought to uh, explain ethnic differences in disease risk. They may well be contributory, but they're not the whole part of the picture. There is still an excess risk of getting COVID-19 among Asian and Asian British participants in COVID-19 that's not explained by socioeconomic factors. What about body mass index? Well, again, we know from hospitalisation data that people with uh, who are overweight uh, or obese are at higher risk of requiring hospital with COVID-19. What our data from COVID in UK show is that there's about a 50% increased risk of getting COVID-19 in the first place. So this uh, appears to be a risk factor not just for severity but also for susceptibility as well. What about risks uh, associated with uh, going out of the house? So what we looked at in great detail in our questionnaire were factors relating to how frequently people went to indoor public places such as churches, shops, etc. How frequently people visited each other's households, what type of household they lived in, how many people there were per bedroom and what their job was, whether or not they're involved with frontline work, either in health or social care or in the community, for example, working in public transport, schools um, or the police. And what we showed uh, was that many of these exposure factors were associated with increased risk of getting mild or moderate disease, as one might expect. So you can see here an increasing risk of uh, mild or moderate COVID-19 uh, increasing with the number of people per bedroom. That's a measure of overcrowding at home, increasing with the number of household visits that people made or received uh, in the week prior to questionnaire completion and increasing with the number of visits to indoor public places. This includes shops, places of worship, cafes, etc., and also with occupation. Uh, so people on frontline occupations having higher risk of getting COVID-19 than those who weren't. What about underlying conditions? So we know that people who have heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, and other conditions are at increased risk of severe disease. In COVID-19 UK, do these people have a higher risk of getting COVID-19 in the first place? Well, I've got a reassuring uh, message for you here in that the answer is no. So when we look at people according to their diabetic status, whether or not they have heart disease, arterial disease or high blood pressure, there was no statistically significant increase in risk or decrease in risk after adjusting for people's behaviour in terms of how often they went out to the shops, etc. So in this area, what we've shown is that these underlying conditions don't seem to affect susceptibility to disease, even though they affect severity of disease if you're uh, unlucky enough to catch uh, COVID-19. One area we're particularly interested in was allergic disease, uh, diseases such as uh, hay fever or allergic rhinitis and eczema or atopic dermatitis. Uh, 
And the reason we're interested in this is because there's some data suggesting that people who have allergic immune responses may have lower levels of the receptor for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is called ACE2. And indeed, when we looked at the data from Covidence UK, we found that people who either reported having eczema or um, uh, hay fever or both had about a 25% reduced risk of contracting COVID-19 compared to people who didn't have allergic disease. And again, that's adjusted for uh, those uh, over 20 potential confounding factors. And again, the reason we think that might be mediated is because people with allergic disease have been reported to have lower levels of this receptor ACE2 on their airways compared to people without allergic disease. So to summarise our findings, we can now look at risk factors for developing COVID-19 and compare them with risk factors for getting severe disease. So what our analysis has shown is that uh, there's a range of factors which relate exposure to SARS-CoV-2 and increased risk of getting COVID-19. And these include household overcrowding, visits to and from other households, visits to indoor public places and working in frontline occupation. We've also shown that being overweight and being of Asian or Asian British ethnic origin is also associated with increased risk of developing COVID-19 in the first place. Interestingly, we've also found that having allergic disease such as hay fever or eczema is associated with a decreased risk of getting COVID-19 in the first place. Now let's see how these factors compare with the risk factors for getting severe COVID-19. So there's an overlap in terms of obesity and being of Asian or Asian British ethnic origin. But a number of risk factors for severe COVID-19 don't appear to affect susceptibility to getting the disease in the first place. And these include older age, male sex, ischemic heart disease, diabetes and high blood pressure. So what's the bottom line here? Well, first of all, I think it's important to highlight that what we've shown is that indoor contact with others is a major risk factor for getting COVID-19. This really underpins the good sense of uh, government advice to uh, minimise indoor socialising at the moment um, and it really explains why lockdowns have been effective in bringing down infection risk. A second really interesting finding uh, that we've made relates to the fact that allergic diseases associate with a decreased risk of getting COVID-19 and this may be mediated through the effect of having a lower expression of the ACE2 receptor which is the receptor for the SARS-CoV-2 virus in the lung. A third key finding is that We've shown here that many risk factors for severe disease, such as male sex um, uh, and older age, don't associate with susceptibility to disease. So people who are male, older uh, or who have heart disease may get more severe disease if they are infected with SARS-CoV-2, but it doesn't make them more susceptible to infection in the first place. However, two factors, obesity and being of South Asian ethnic origin, were associated with both susceptibility disease and severity of disease after very rigorous adjustment for socioeconomic factors. So if you want to read more about these uh, findings, uh, they were covered in the Daily Express a couple of weeks ago, or you can go to the source and uh, click on the link which will be under this YouTube video to download a copy of our new manuscript which reports these findings in detail. And I would encourage you to uh, have a read and share with your social networks as widely as possible. So what are the next steps? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is to try and get down to the science of why uh, being overweight and being of South Asian ethnic origin it, uh, are risk factors both for infection and for severity of disease. And a major focus in this regard relates to um, our work around vitamin D deficiency. We know that being overweight uh, is a risk factor for vitamin D deficiency, as is being of South Asian ethnic origin. So this really underlines uh, the major emphasis within the study, uh, looking at the effect of vitamin D status on susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2. A second major direction will be now to analyse the large body of data that we've now accumulated on antibody tests. We now have results uh, in from over 12,000 participants. We're just clearing up the last few this week. I hope you those of you who have done antibody tests have received your results uh, now. Uh, as I say, the last 500 or so will be coming out uh, this weekend. So hopefully by next week, everybody will have got their results. And we'll be in a position next month to uh, report results of preliminary analyses of that antibody data set uh, to you in the next webinar. But until then, 
Many thanks for taking part in the study from all of us to all of you. Until next month, goodbye.